Well, I have the joy this morning of introducing a friend to you. For some of you, he doesn't need introduction because uh, Brian Chesmore served us over the weekend in a, a marathon parenting <laughs> service. Uh, if you were there Friday night, Saturday, and then again Saturday night, uh, he just was providing a overwhelming flood of biblical counsel for parenting. And for those who are there, we're very, very grateful uh, for how he invested in our church over the weekend. Um, but for those of you who weren't there, let me introduce Brian to you. Brian, uh, first of all, the first thing that I want to say is that he is a friend. Mm -hmm. And a friend to a, a pastor in another church that has the same convictions and believes the same gospel mm -hmm. and has the same passion about the local church is a gift to a local church because of the way that friend can lift up and support and encourage the pastor. And that's how Brian has been towards me for many years. So much of our ministry, me, Aaron, and Bart in this church is explained largely because of the friends we have in ministry that have taught us, that have inspired us, that have encouraged us, that have warned us that have exhorted us, and Brian is one of those friends. So in many ways, Brian has been ministering to this church uh, since its foundation uh, through his ministry to us. Uh, Brian is a pastor of Sovereign Grace Church of Louisville, so we have a, a multiple uh, debt to him. He serves as the host church pastor, one of the pastors of the host church for the Pastors College. And as you know, we sent Bart this last year with his family to benefit from that pastor's college. Well, that's a lot of work for their local church. Uh, they have to host those families. They have to serve them. They have to provide uh, babysitting at times from their membership for those folks. Uh, they and many of their pastors teach in that college. And most importantly, they welcome them on a Sunday on behalf of all of our churches. Uh, Brian represents that pastoral team in coming to us. And so when we thank him this morning, I, I want us to thank him also for all of his hosting of Bart and Jessica and that and Boone this last year. In addition to that, uh, Brian is a wise and godly pastor. Uh, he has pastored now for since the inception of this church plant in Louisville, Kentucky. He oversees uh, really the entire church. As the senior pastor CJ will say, this church is ultimately built on Brian and on my sister Bethany who serves as their admin. <laughs> uh, so we're really seeing the man who makes it happen behind the scenes and that's an appropriate name for him because Brian is a humble man. Mm -hmm. He loves to serve. He loves to serve behind the scenes. He loves to care for people. He loves to pastor people. And one of the reasons I wanted him to speak to us uh, on this topic this morning is it, it's a pastoral topic from the Psalms. It's a topic where a pastor is needed to shepherd our hearts. And I believe this is a faithful shepherd who will be speaking to us this morning. So let's welcome Brian as he comes to shepherd us through the Word of God. Thank you. Thank you, my friend. Appreciate it. <laughs> Good to know. Well, it is such a privilege for me to be with each of you this morning. So thank you, John, for that kind introduction. Let me just say on behalf of the pastors of the church in Louisville, and I know I can speak on behalf of Jeff Perswell and Gary Ricucci, who serve at the Pastors College, that we are so grateful for your investment uh, into Bart and Jessica and their family and into your church by sending them to the Pastors College. I know it's no small thing to give up one of your best for nearly a year so that he might receive training. But I, I trust you're receiving the benefits of that sacrifice, and I just want to say how grateful we are for you as a church having that kind of faith and that kind of sacrifice to send Bart and Jessica and their children up to be with us for the year. And what a joy it was to get to know Bart during that time a few years earlier. I had the joy of getting to know Aaron and Holly in the Pastors College. And so to come down here and to be with you and to see your church is something I've been looking forward to. And what a wonderful pastoral team you have. What a wonderful church family you have. I've really been impressed by the hunger for God's Word and the enjoyment that so many of the parents here are having in the grace of God. So numerous parents have pulled me aside and just talked about how delighted they are to be in the Word with this local church and, and understanding and appreciating, experiencing the grace of God in new uh, and deeper ways. So what a joy it is for me to come and be with you and to taste of what you're experiencing 
John has been a friend of mine for many years, and as I walked through a season of personal trial, uh, John became an even closer friend during that time several years ago. John would call me regularly, make sure I was staying sane and trusting the Lord and walking through uh, challenges and hardship with my heart fixed on God, and so he has been a faithful friend. So in so many ways for us uh, as a local church, it was a joy for me to, to step aside for the weekend and come down here and be with you. So thank you. Please Please know that the church in Louisville is praying for you all, and even this morning I was praying for you as we gathered together. So please turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Psalm 73. It's a real privilege for me to step into your series on the Psalms and to play a small part. This is a wonderful Psalm that I, I trust will become even richer to us as we take some time to study it this morning, Psalm 73. Have you ever wondered why the Christian life seems so often to be played on an uneven field? Maybe you've walked through times where you've tried hard to be faithful to God, maybe to obey God, to walk in His ways, but you keep getting met with difficulty upon difficulty. Meanwhile, it's not hard for us to look around as it and see those who have no interest in the things of God and they're prospering. They're experiencing ease and bliss, prosperity, abounding. Why does it seem that so often in life, the bad guys are lavished with riches and ease while the children of God face trial upon trial? All we have to do is look back over church history and we see this has been the norm. Maybe you've heard of John Bunyan faithful pastor in England who wrote the beloved book Pilgrim's Progress. He spent 12 years wrongfully imprisoned for his faith, and that's where he wrote that book. William Tyndale was burned at the stake for no greater crime than wanting to translate the Bible into the English language. Meanwhile, the king and high church leaders of that day, they mocked, they scorned them, and yet they seem to be safe and secure and even prospering in their wickedness. Why is it maybe more personally here, numerous individuals in this room who have sought to trust the Lord and walk with the Lord and make sacrifices for the kingdom only seem to experience and return pain? Meanwhile, we turn on our TVs and we see men and women who are uninterested in the things of God, prospering, esteeming themselves, valuing what God despises, and yet they're receiving the good life. What we've seen throughout church history, what we have seen maybe in our midst to some degree personally, we will see from Scripture is actually nothing new. Uh, we'll see from this psalm, this is no new phenomenon. God wor God's Word speaks right to these questions of the uneven, uneven playing field of life. In fact, in Psalm 73, our psalm this morning, the author is living in a world affected by the reality of sin. He's aware of this uneven playing field, and he asks the question, why do the wicked prosper and the righteous suffer? Why is that? Why does it seem as if God is showering the wrong people with his goodness? The psalm is really an honest testimony of how this dynamic was almost too much for the psalmist Asaph to bear. It's to become a psalm for each of us as well this morning. When we feel in our hearts that maybe God has not been good to us, that maybe God is not treating us as we deserve, we deeply need this psalm's insights. They will protect us in very dark days when the obedient life seems anything but good when God himself doesn't seem good to us. So let's look at this psalm together. Look with me as I read the entirety of Psalm 73. Asaph writes, Truly, God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For they have no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. They are not in trouble as others are. 
They are not stricken like the rest of mankind. Therefore, pride is their necklace. Violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes swell out through fatness. Their hearts overflow with follies. They scoff and speak with malice. Loftily, they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against the heavens, and their tongue struts through the earth. Therefore, his people turn back to them and find no fault in them. And they say, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked. Always at ease, they increase in riches. All in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all the day long I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. If I had said, I will speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I discerned their end. Truly, you set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors. Like a dream when one awakes, O oh Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast toward you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. But for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. This is the word of God. So why is it that believers so often fail to flourish, to taste of the good life, and yet those who oppose God seem to be untouched so often by life's hardships? I believe this psalm masterfully resolves those questions for us by directing our attention to two experiences that the psalmist had in relation to the pursuit of the good life. Two experiences with God's goodness that we're going to look at this morning. Let me start with the first, the goodness of God obscured. The goodness of God obscured. Did you notice how this psalm begins with a declaration? Look with me again at verse 1. Truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. Here we have what is, I think, a clear and succinct statement of the psalmist's theology. Here we have his creed, if you will, a truth he was likely taught in his youth. Asaph has served as director of the Sanctuary Choir, and I would imagine that this theme found its way into many of the songs that the Israelites sang together. Truly, God is good. You might render this, God is only good, always good. Truly, God is good. And his goodness is directed towards his people, Israel. Truly, God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. In other words, not simply to those of a nationality, but to his Israel, to those whose hearts, whose allegiance is directed fully to God. He is their object of worship and, and of devotion. Thus, they are pure in heart. Not perfect in heart, but pure in heart. And Asaph declares on behalf of his fellow worshipers, truly God is good to us. That is, not merely in what he does for us, providing kind of the material needs that we need on a day-to-day. -day. Certainly that's true, but in who he is for us. That's what the psalmist is saying. It's like the echo of Psalm 46. God is our refuge in the midst of every trouble. He's a shepherd to us. Asaph is declaring the goodness of God with particular conviction on this day. You see, the truth of God's goodness, this truth that he's declaring, it's been rediscovered by Asaph. 
to regain his trust in the goodness of God, Asaph has gone on quite a journey. He had to come through severe adversity, spiritual crisis, where Asaph almost lost his way entirely. So to be able to say and to believe in the love of the goodness of God is a rediscovery for Asaph. It's a fresh joy to him. So first one is no platitude. John Calvin, when he studied this psalm, he recognized this and he said, the psalmist does not ascend into the chair to dispute after the manner of philosophers and to deliver his discourse in a style of studied oratory, but as if he had escaped from hell. He proclaims with a loud voice and with impassioned feeling that he had obtained the victory. His victory, won through the fires of severe testing, was in restored conviction. That's his victory, a restored conviction in the goodness of God. Sinclair Ferguson captured this well as he says of this psalmist, it's the pilgrim's progress to strengthen faith in the goodness of God. Do you need strength and faith this morning in the goodness of God? This psalmist needed. At different times, all Christians need strength and faith in the goodness of God. We know that this is true because of the humble acknowledgement that comes to us in verses 2 through 3. He says, But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. So the psalmist is not here writing about a potentially scratched knee or some minor difficulty he had experienced. The psalmist is looking us in the eyes and he's saying to us, friends, it could not have been more serious for me. I almost let go. There's a picture of his feet stumbling, dangerously slipping. It's a confession that he had almost left the truth completely. To slip was to fall dangerously off the firm ground of his creed that God is good. Why? What brought about this danger in the psalmist's life? Maybe you caught it as I was reading. With the word four in verse three, the psalmist humbly brings us into the reason that his feet had almost slipped. Look with, ver- look with me at verse three. He says, for I was envious, envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of of the wicked. So in effect, the psalmist had begun to look around and to study those around him. And he was troubled by what he saw. He was studying the lifestyles of those who do not know God, do not follow God, reject God. And what he found stunned him. Their lives were not marked by hardship as if they were receiving the consequences of not following the living God. Instead, their lives were marked by ease, blessing prosperity. In fact, this psalm devotes the next nine verses to Asaph's observations. It's what you could call his documentary on the prosperity of God's enemies. So let's take a little look at his documentary. First, we notice that their health is strong. Verse 4 tells us they have no pangs until death. And they seem to eat well. (laughs) Their bodies are fat and sleek, Asaph says may not sound inviting to you, but remember this is an agrarian society and they don't have storehouses or refrigerators. Um, The average person lived upon their daily bread, not their stockpiles. So the fact that these people are fat, uh, that speaks well of their provision of food on the day to day. They've got plenty of food. They've become fat with provision. They don't really know trouble. Did you notice in verse 5, they're not in trouble as others are. They're not stricken like the rest of mankind. As a, it's as if they're getting a pass on troubles that the rest of us know. And sadly, but maybe no surprise, they attribute all this prosperity to their own doing. You see in verse 6 there, pride is their necklace. Pride is what they wear. They attribute all this prosperity to their own doing. They attained their wealth. They attained their ease and their own strength, they think. We need to make no mistake here. These aren't the good guys of Israel. In their arrogance, they actually oppress others with violence. Verse 6 says, violence covers them as a garment. They're fat with conceit. And meanwhile, their hearts are filled to overflowing with foolish ideas, foolish thoughts, and plans. You would not want these guys making plans for your life. 
and their speech, no surprise, it's revealing. From their, the folly of their hearts flow unbelieving statements, harmful statements towards God. Verse 8, it says they scoff, they speak with malice, loftily, they threaten oppression. As you notice, verse 9, their tongue struts through the earth. I love that language. And somehow, despite their arrogance, despite their violent lifestyles, we see in verse 10 that they seem to amass a following. It's as if Asaph is seeing God's professed people turn away and follow after these men and women who are experiencing what seems to be prosperity. God's own people are leaving, turning back from truth to drink up the prosperity that they're seeing others consume. And what do the enemies of God do? They challenge the very character and being of God. They say, how can God know? Is there any knowledge in the Most High? See, they're not rejecting God altogether. That would not have been in vogue. They are just saying, God's indifferent to us. God doesn't matter to us. Does God really know anything of consequence? Does God's perspective really carry any weight? They seek to tell God what he's like, and they've decided he's just altogether irrelevant. So this vivid imagery, this documentary should cause us to pause and think. Somehow these people are so bad, they, they got it so good, and their prosperity just won't let up. Uh, the vivid imagery and extensive portrayal of God's enemies should impress upon us. Asaph has become just a bit preoccupied, hasn't he? I mean, he's really taken it in, how these people live. He's studying them, and as he studies them, he becomes preoccupied with them. Not only is he noting what their lives are like, but his heart is being drawn towards them. Now we understand a bit better why his feet had begun to slip. He becomes so preoccupied with their prosperity, the prosperity of the arrogant, that his heart had begun to move dangerously towards them. So we have to watch out as we study those who don't know God, study those who seem to be prospering, that our hearts don't get attracted to the prosperity they're experiencing. He wasn't looking to call these people out. He wasn't appealing they'd be locked up. He wanted what they wanted. He wanted blessing. He wanted prosperity. He wanted ease. This man of God had begun to envy the, the wicked, and as a result, his feet were perilously close to slipping off of bedrock truth that he had grown up believing. He was about to toss aside his faith altogether. So the psalmist was getting dangerously close to be believing that goodness could be found apart from God. And with verse 12, the psalmist draws his conclusion. You can almost hear him sigh as he concludes, Always at ease, they increase in riches. Always prospering. If this was a stock market, the trend is only upward <laughs> for their investment. A constant upward trend. You see, friends, the world that the psalmist lived in, it's like our world. It's simply not fair at times. But the problem of their prosperity is compounded by what the psalmist himself is enduring in this season. From his prolonged and insightful study of the prosperous enemies, he now moves and takes us to look at his own life a little bit. His own challenges that he's enduring. He says, All in vain have I kept my heart clean, washed my hands in innocence. For all the day long I've been stricken and rebuked every morning. What a disturbing conclusion. The psalmist kind of pulls back the veil and says, let me tell you what was going on in my heart. I had concluded, after studying the wicked and seeing them prosper, that all of my efforts to follow after the things of God, maybe it was just all in vain. Maybe it just wasn't worth it. Maybe all my energies and all my efforts to follow in God's ways was actually a joke. Have you ever been tempted to think that way? These are the words that we should dread hearing. You see, in the original, the same truly of verse 1, truly God is good to Israel, has been replaced by truly it is all in vain. 
His sound doctrine has been overshadowed by his utter despondency. His sound doctrine had been overshadowed by the circumstances around him that he was preoccupied in studying. Have you ever known a believer to get to this place? Have you ever been that believer who has gotten to this place where you're so busy studying your circumstances and studying the prosperity of those who don't follow after God that you begin to lose heart, that you begin to wonder, is it all in vain? It's heartbreaking. Maybe your life is challenging right now. Maybe you've been dutifully trying to obey God day after day after day, but the math just doesn't seem to add up. Well, verse 5 says that the wicked are not stricken like the rest of mankind. You look at verse 14, and he says, All day long I have been stricken, all day long, and rebuked every morning. It's as if Asaph gets up day after day to try it again, only to get slapped down again. God's harsh providences don't seem to line up with his alleged goodness. Those are tough days for the psalmist. Look at the ungodly. They do nothing for God. They have it so good. Look at me. I go to the synagogue. I lead in songwriting, he says. I pray. I seek to believe. And it just feels like every day is one big slap down. To head into my day is to be slapped down, stricken, and rebuked. I can't seem to get off the losing team. Spurgeon captures the confusion of the psalmist, what he's experiencing. Listen to this. There were crowns for the reprobates and crosses for the elect. Strange that the saints should sigh and the sinners sing. Rest was given to the disturbers, and yet peace was denied to the peacemakers. The downcast seer was in a muse and a maze. The affairs of mankind appeared to him to be in a fearful tangle. How could it be permitted by a just ruler that things should be so turned upside down and the whole course of justice dislocated? These are dark days for the psalmist. Maybe this morning is a dark day for you. Discouraged by circumstances. Maybe you're starting to grow cynical about obedience. Maybe you find envy welling up in your heart. You can almost feel yourself moving away in your affections and your allegiance to God. The psalmist has been moving. Not yet in his actions, but in his mind. No temptation has overtaken us that is not common to man. Every believer is tempted to study his or her hard providences, to look over the fence, if you will, and study the circumstances of those around us who seem to have it so good. If that's you, God wants to meet you in your dark day. God wants to be near to you in your dark day. And as we keep reading, we see the psalmist brings us into a ray of light that appears. An evidence of God-honoring grace is expressed in the, psalmist li- in the psalmist's life. Notice that in the midst of his disturbing thoughts, the psalmist has some restraint, some godly restraint. Verse 15, he said, if I had said, I will speak thus, if I had said, I will speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. What's going on there? See, his conclusions that he's beginning to draw, they disturb even him. And he recognizes that if he begins to share this, to acknowledge his unbelief to those around him, the way his heart is trending, it would go difficult for those who hear him. He had a conscience is a category for the need not just to vent his discouragements, not to view them as authoritative, a word to share with his fellow believers. As a man who has been given godly responsibility over the years, he feels a restraint to not carelessly speak in such a manner that could harm believers around him. So he bites his tongue. He holds his words. Now, this is not an apologetic, friends, for not getting help when we're struggling with unbelief. Okay, that's not what's going on here. Okay, it's a humble recognition that our doubts are not to be carelessly spewed upon those around us who may be tempted in similar ways. Remember verse 10, others have been foolishly turning away from God, following the prospering wicked. And Asaph doesn't want to rattle his community of believers by just carelessly spewing his fears, his doubts, his unbelief. Spurgeon again captures the tension that he felt in his silence. 
Spurgeon writes, the thought of scandalizing the family of God he could not bear, and yet his inward thoughts seethed and fermented and caused an intolerable anguish within. To speak might have relieved one sorrow, but as it would have created another, he forbore so dangerous a remedy. Yet this did not remove the first pangs, which grew even worse and worse and threatened to utterly overwhelm him. Do you start to feel the tension, the struggle, the wrestling that the psalmist is going through in his life? He didn't want to share carelessly, but he didn't know how to find his way out of the confusion that he was experiencing. So how can this be, he asks. I always thought that God was good, but now I'm not so sure. And he's struggling. Read verse 16. But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task. Isn't this what suffering does to us? Spiritual struggle. It's like a fog sets into our life, and we can't find our way through it. We can't find our way out. We know what we've believed, but we're having trouble taking a hold of it by faith and feeling the effects and living in the good of faith. Trying to understand God's mysteries in his life had led Asaph to a dangerous place. It's helpful for us to know that it's not our responsibility, nor is it our forte, to understand at all times God's providences in our lives. I like what Sinclair Ferguson says. He says, Asaph increased his depression by trying to understand all the intricacies of God's ways. The same can be true for us. This only breeds a sense of suspicion of God, a darkness of spirit, and it tempts us to take matters into our own hands. But that would be to mistrust providence and to reject the wisdom and love of God. Alone in his wearisome task of trying to understand God's ways, Asaph was depressed. He was in secret anguish. Until. Until. What an important word. Look at verse 17 with me. Some would say that this word until is the most important word in the entire psalm. He says, until I went into the sanctuary of God. With this word, we're ushered into a restoration of the truth that truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. So let's look now from the goodness of God obscured to the goodness of God restored. The psalmist writes, until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I discerned their end. This maze of soul that the psalmist was finding trouble getting his way out of, it required the good hand of a merciful, all-knowing God to lead him into clarity. All that the psalmist had observed, what did it lack? It lacked God's perspective. It lacked God's vantage point. His observations were at best limited. At worst, they were void altogether of the wisdom of God. You see, wisdom is found in God, not simply studying our circumstances endlessly. Wisdom comes to us as God reveals himself, as he grants revelation to the psalmist. And so the tone of the psalm, it just all pivots at this point now. The life of the psalmist is rescued by the kind intervention of God. The goodness of God is restored to his view by the kind intervention of God. All was confusion until. All was wearisome until. All stability was slipping until. Until what? Until I went in to the sanctuary of God. Now, I regret to inform you that I can't tell you exactly what happened in the sanctuary, okay? But we know that Asaph met with God. He had the experience of meeting with God personally. Here in the place where God's people come together to hear the word of the Lord, to pray together, God showed up. God met, met with Asaph, and it made all the difference. See, every believer needs the restoring effect of being in the presence of God, receiving that perspective that God alone provides there is to steal uh, an old title of one of CJ's sermons, the transforming of a d effect of a divine perspective. The transforming effect of a divine perspective. That's what Asaph received when he went into the sanctuary. You see, in God's presence, 
the wicked no longer have center stage. In God's presence, the psalmist is brought back into the reality that God actually reigns supremely over all the events we see. God sees through them all with perfect clarity. And the psalmist gains the clarity that he so desperately needed. And note the effect of being in the presence of God. Let's look a little bit at the effect of being in the presence of God. Asaph sees and believes now in God's justice, something that he had lost sight of. He has a renewed confidence now in God's justice. In meeting with God, the psalmist receives an education, if you will, in justice. He learns about their end, the end of the wicked. In other words, his documentary is shown for what it is. It's too short a study. See, Asaph had zeroed in on one point in time in the lives of these unbelievers, in the lives of these wicked men and women and their prosperity. What Asaph was fixed upon was actually just a moment in time that was going to slip away. He was looking with a microscope upon the wicked. He needed to look with binoculars and be able to see the broader landscape, the long-term view. See, Asaph's perspective when he was struggling, it lacked the divine revelation of God's coming justice. In the sanctuary, we're told in verse 18, truly, you set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors, like a dream when one awakes. O oh Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. See, those who oppose God, who are living recklessly for the things of this world, eventually it will catch up to them. They always stand on a slippery slope, but maybe just don't recognize it. It's the thinnest of footing that keeps the wicked from ruin. For those who don't honor, respect, believe in God and his ways, justice is coming. Let that settle upon you if this morning you do not know the living God. Let that settle upon you this morning if you're trying to find your stability in the things of this world. There is the thinnest of ground underneath you between you and justice. See, all the injustice of this world, all that seemed out of order, we will learn God will set right. God is just. God will not be mocked. God will, in the end, show his goodness in justice. Not only does he see God's justice with new eyes, he sees himself with new eyes. And that's important for us, to have God's perspective on our own hearts and lives. And so Asaph gains a renewed confidence in God's goodness. So not just a renewed confidence in God's justice, but it's a renewed confidence in God's goodness to me personally that I need in these times. See, in meeting with God, the psalmist is humbled. All this envy he had been cultivating, making, a, making room for, it had ultimately made him bitter. And his bitterness, he now sees, had made him act like a beast. A beast. His assessment had been woefully off. Look at verse 21. He says, When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast towards God. Have you ever been bitter towards the Lord? So caught up in your circumstances and the difficulties of your life that you've concluded that God is not good, that I don't like his rule, I don't trust his care, his shepherding of my life. See, when our hearts conclude that God is not good, we become brutish. We become like beasts. So he says he was more like a beast than the prophet he was supposed to be, more like an animal than an example to his fellow believers. But in the sanctuary of God, the psalmist also sees how he has been and will always be the recipient of God's mercies. So it's in the sanctuary, in the presence of God, that he experiences this needed conviction for sin. He needed God's perspective that he, so that he might see his sin rightly and turn away from it. And now as he does, he's able to see clearly how God has actually been caring for him and carrying him through this whole season. Verse 23, nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will receive me to glory. 
after feeling forsaken by God, rebuked every morning, struck down, the psalmist now sees and he acknowledges, actually, I've never been alone. All those dark days where I felt like I was alone, I was always being cared for by the all-wise, purposeful God. He was at work in my life, loving me, sustaining me. So friends, when our circumstances seem to contradict God's word, when our difficulties seem to not line up with the declaration that God is good, we need to trust in his word. We need to allow the truths of the word to preach to our souls, to not grow quiet in dark days. What if he had taken to heart Psalm 37? Do you remember these words in Psalm 37? Fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. What if he had taken to heart that counsel, bought into it, believed it, held it tightly, and let it guide and govern his soul? His feet would not have slipped, would not have almost stumbled. But God, in his kindness, allowed this psalmist to go through this season so that we might benefit from the dangers he endured. So friends, we, like the psalmist, we have in God's revelation a a perfect revealing of his will, all that we need for life and godliness. See, God is going to act justly towards the wicked, and God is going to be merciful to his children. In fact, his mercy is so great that even when we are slipping because of our envy, because of our faithless wanderings, verse 23 is true. We are continually with God. He holds us. Along the way, he counsels us. See, it's not the strength of my grip that keeps me in the Christian life, is it? It's not the strength of your grip. It's the fact that God is continually with us. And along the way, he shows us his glory. See, when God reveals himself to us, here's the result. When we go into the sanctuary, when we encounter the living God, here's what happens. We change. God transforms us, and we think differently, and we see differently, and we love differently, and we trust differently. See, to meet with God, to see things from his perspective, is to have a transforming effect upon our lives, and the goodness of God gets restored to our view. And when it does, we want nothing more than to experience his goodness for all of our days and into eternity. And so as we come to the closing verses of Psalm 73, Asaph declares the creed that he grew up believing. It's now again the joy of his heart. Listen to him praise the goodness and the majesty of God in verse 25. He says, whom have I in heaven but you? This God who he was drifting from, he's now declaring, you're all I have. You're all I have, Lord, and there is nothing on earth that I desire beside you. He is able to forsake the riches, the ease, the prosperity, the temporary blessing. He knows that it's all fading. And he says, what do I need on this earth? God, I need you. I need you to capture my heart. I need you to be the affection of my soul, the object of my desire. That's what I need. Nothing compares. There's simply no greater privilege in life than to have God. And he notes in verse 26, my heart and my flesh may fail. His circumstances may grow difficult again. At some point in this life, he will die. But he knows that this adversity, in the midst of this adversity, that there is a self-revealing, loving, good, and always wise God who's going to be his strength. He says, the strength of my heart my portion forever. When the goodness of God was obscured, it caused great trouble in the psalmist's life. But now from God's self-revelation, the goodness has been restored. It's been revealed to him. But friends, the goodness of God has been revealed to us in the surest of ways. And what Asaph saw in the sanctuary, we actually get to see with even greater clarity this side of the cross. See, when we read Psalm 73, we get to read it with Jesus in view. Okay, has God been good to us? Oh, absolutely. How do we know that? We look at the cross. Think of the songs we were singing this morning. 
the precious blood of Jesus shed for us. How do we know the goodness of God? We know because God did not spare his son, but gave him up for us all. See, the glory of God, the goodness of God, it's seen most clearly, it's experienced most truly in the person of Jesus Christ. He is the one who has come from the Father's very presence, that we might know the love of the Father, that we might experience the goodness of the Father, the mercies of the Father. He has poured out his spirit that we might be able to say on a daily basis that God is our Abba, Father. The spirit testifies that we are children and that we are the recipients of the goodness of God. I think of Romans 8, verse 18. Let me just turn there and read this for you. Think about the goodness of God on this side of the cross. Think of the Apostle Paul's perspective. He says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. <laughs> See, Paul has in view sufferings. I'm sure he has in view prosperity of the wicked, but because he has an eternal perspective, because he has a perspective informed by the gospel of Jesus Christ, he says these sufferings of the present time, they're not even worth comparing to the glory that's going to be revealed in our lives. Look what he says in verse 31 of chapter 8. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? In all these things, verse 37, we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So it's God's kind intention that through his son we would rest in the goodness of God that we would trust in the goodness of God to be able to say with the psalmist, truly, truly God is good to Israel. God is the strength of my heart, my portion forever. It's been a long road for the psalmist as he writes these words, but this arduous, soul-wrenching journey that the psalmist has been on, it's providentially borne some really sweet fruit in his life. For the psalmist, there's no good like God. He's rediscovered that truth. There's no good apart from God. Look at verse 28. He concludes, But for me, it is good to be near God. What is goodness to him now? It's not to have things. It's not to experience ease. It's not to be able to do what I want in the ways of this world. Goodness to the psalmist is rightly restored. It is to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. Did you catch that last phrase? The psalmist, who had to shut his mouth for fear of wrongly influencing the children of God, now wants to tell. He now wants to speak because he knows that God has restored to him a right view of God, a right view of God's goodness, and he wants to tell other people about it. No longer are his words going to potentially do damage. Now his words are going to bring about good as through his lips he's able to testify and to tell that the God of Israel is a good and gracious and just God, a God who guides and shepherds our lives and who works out justice perfectly in the end. And friends, we too have a story to tell, don't we? We have a story to tell of a God who has proven his goodness most clearly in the cross of his son. He who did not spare his son, but gave him up for, his, for us all, will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Friends, we have a story to tell. Let's not put our hands over our mouths when it comes to the goodness of God. Let's go out and let's tell our community, let's tell our friends, Let's tell our family members that truly God is good to Israel, to his children. So this psalm, friends, it teaches us that in the midst of a seemingly constant call to abandon God, to run after pleasures of this world which are so fleeting, that God's goodness is the true source of our joy and a reliable object of our trust. God's goodness 
is the true source of our joy and the reliable object of our trust. So let's look to him to experience goodness. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the story of the psalmist, for his humility, and not only walking through this journey, but capturing it in Scripture, that we might benefit from it. We know that is your goodness to us, to protect us, to open our eyes, to see that there is danger for us in running after the fleeting pleasures of this world. There is danger for us in questioning your goodness with short-sighted view. There is danger for us in questioning your justice as we simply stare with a microscope at the events of our day. Father, we thank you for psalms like this which enable us to step back and to see the bigger picture. And for psalms like this that call us to step towards you into your sanctuary and to experience your presence. Father, I pray that as we have come together this day, and done, in a sense, what the psalmist did on that day. We have come together in your presence to sit under your word, to pray with the people of God, to worship you. I pray that you would restore perspective. Pray that you would restore hope, that you would meet each person here with a renewed faith and a fresh experience of your goodness, the goodness of God, that we might all be able to say that what we want, that what we long for, is to dwell near God. We pray in Jesus' name, the one who has most clearly displayed your goodness. Amen.